Chapter Eleven: Warriors of the Paintbrush. When the great European war broke out, it was very evident that the Entente Allies would have to exercise every resource to beat the foe which had been preparing for years to conquer the world but whoever imagined that geologists would be called in to choose the best places for boring mines under the enemy that meteorologists would be summoned to forecast the weather and determine the best time to launch an offensive that psychologists would be employed to pick out the men with the best nerves to man the machine guns and pilot the battle planes certainly no one guessed that artists and the makers of stage scenery would play an important part in the conflict but the airplane filled the sky with eyes that at first made it impossible for an army to conceal its plans from the enemy and then there were eyes that swam in the sea cruel eyes that belonged to deadly submarine monsters eyes that could see without being seen eyes that could pop out of the water at unexpected moments eyes that directed deadly missiles at inoffensive merchantmen they were cowardly eyes too which gave the ships no opportunity to strike back at the unseen enemy a vessel's only safety lay in the chance that out in the broad reaches of the ocean it might pass beyond the range of those lurking eyes it was a game of hide-and-seek in which the pursuer and not the pursued was hidden something had to be done to conceal the pursued as well but in the open sea there was nothing to hide behind hiding in plain sight there is such a thing as hiding in plain sight you can look right at a tree toad without seeing him because his colors blend perfectly with the tree to which he is clinging you can watch a green leaf curl up and shrivel without realizing that the curled edge is really a caterpillar cunningly veined and colored to look just like a dying leaf and out in the woods a speckled bird or striped animal will escape observation just because it matches the spotted light that comes through the underbrush nature is constantly protecting its helpless animals with colored coats that blend with the surroundings long ago clumsy attempts at concealment were made when war vessels were given a coat of dark gray paint which was supposed to make them invisible at a distance actually the paint made them more conspicuous but then concealment did not count for very much before the present war it was the eyes of the submarines that brought a hurry call for the artists and up to them was put the problem of hiding ships in plain sight a new name was coined for these warriors of the paintbrush camoufleurs they were called and their work was known as camouflage matching the sky of course no paint will make a ship absolutely invisible at a short distance but a large vessel may be made to disappear completely from view at a distance of six or seven miles if it is properly painted to be invisible a ship must reflect as much light and the same shade of light as do its surroundings if it is seen against the background of the sea it must be of a bluish or a greenish tint but a submarine lies so low in the water that any object seen at a distance is silhouetted against the sky and so the ship must have a coat of paint that will reflect the same colors as does the sky now the sky may be of almost any color of the rainbow depending upon the position of the sun and the amount of vapor or dust in the air fortunately in the north sea and the waters about the british isles where most of the submarine attacks took place the weather is hazy most of the time and the ship had to be painted of such a color that it would reflect the same light as that reflected by a hazy sky with a background of haze and more or less haze between the ship and the periscope of the u-boat it was not a very difficult matter to paint a ship so that it could be invisible six or seven miles away one shade of gray was used to conceal a ship in the north sea and an entirely different shade was used for the brighter skies of the mediterranean in this way the artists made it possible for ships to sail in safety much nearer the pursuer who was trying to find them and by just so much they reduced his powers of destruction but still the odds were too heavy against the merchantman something must be done for him when he found himself within the seven-mile danger zone 
here again the artists came to the rescue before merchant ships were armed a submarine would not waste a torpedo on them but would pound them into submission with shell even after ships were provided with guns submarines mounted heavier guns and unless a ship was speedy enough to show a clean pair of heels the pursuing u-boat would stand off out of range of the ship's guns and pour a deadly fire into it but the ships too mounted larger guns and the submarines had to fall back upon their torpedoes getting the range for the torpedo in order to fire its torpedo with any certainty the u-boat had to get within a thousand yards of its victim a torpedo travels at from thirty to forty miles per hour it takes time for it to reach its target and a target which is moving at say fifteen knots will travel five hundred yards while a thirty knot torpedo is making one hundred yards and so before the u-boat commander could discharge his torpedo he had to know how fast the ship was travelling and how far away it was from him he could not come to the surface and make deliberate observations but had to stay under cover not daring even to keep his eye out of water for fear that the long wake of foam trailing behind the periscope would give him away all he could do then was to throw his periscope up for a momentary glimpse and make his calculations very quickly then he could move to the position he figured that he should occupy and shoot up his periscope for another glimpse to check up his calculations on the glass of his periscope there were a number of gradations running vertically and horizontally if he knew his victim and happened to know the height of its smokestacks or the length of the boat he noted how many gradations they covered and then by a set formula he could tell how far he was from the boat at the same time he had to work out its rate of travel and note carefully the course it was holding before he could figure where his torpedo must be aimed there was always more or less uncertainty about such observations because they had to be taken hastily and the camoufleurs were not slow to take advantage of this weakness they increased the enemy's confusion by painting high bow waves which made the ship look as if it were travelling at high speed they painted the bow to look like the stern and the stern to look like the bow and the stacks were painted so that they appeared to slant in the opposite direction so that it would look as if the vessel were headed the other way u-boats came to have a very wholesome respect for destroyers and would seldom attack a ship if one of these fast fighting craft was about and so destroyers were painted on the sides of ships as scarecrows to frighten off the enemy making straight lines look crooked we say that seeing is believing but it is not very hard to deceive the eye the lines in figure thirteen look absolutely parallel and they are but cross-hatch the spaces between them with the hatching reversed in alternate spaces as in figure fourteen and they no longer look straight take the letters on the left figure fifteen they look all higgledy-piggledy but they are really straight and parallel as one can prove by laying a straight edge against them or by drawing a straight line through each letter as shown at the right figure sixteen such illusions were used on ships stripes were painted on the hull that tapered slightly from bow to stern so that the vessel appeared to be headed off at an angle when it was really broadside to the watcher at the other end of the periscope there are colour illusions too that were tried if you draw a red chalk mark and a blue one on a perfectly clean blackboard the red line will seem to stand out and the blue one to sink into the black surface of the board because your eye has to focus differently for the two colours and a very dazzling effect can be had with alternating squares of blue and red other colours give even more dazzling effects and some of them when viewed at a distance will blend into the very shade of grey that will make a boat invisible at six miles when u-boat commanders took observations on a ship painted with a dazzle camouflage they saw a shimmering image which it was hard for them to measure on the fine graduations of their periscopes some ships were painted with heavy blotches of black and white and the enemy making a hasty observation would be apt to focus his attention on the dark masses and overlook the white parts 
so he was likely to make a mistake in estimating the height of the smokestack or in measuring the apparent length of a vessel a joke on the photographer early in the submarine campaign one of our boats was given a coat of camouflage and when the vessel sailed from its pier in the north river new york the owners sent a photographer two or three piers down the river to photograph the ship as she went by he took the picture but when the negative was developed much to his astonishment he found that the boat was not at all on the plate in the finder of his camera he had mistaken a heavy band of black paint for the stern of the ship quite overlooking the real stern which was painted a grayish white the artist had fooled the photographer and at a distance of not more than two or three hundred yards seeing beyond the horizon the periscope of a submarine that is running awash can be raised about fifteen feet above the water which means that the horizon as viewed from that elevation is about six miles away and if you draw a circle with a six-mile radius on the map of the atlantic you will find that it is a mere speck in the ocean but a u-boat commander could see objects that lay far beyond his horizon because he was searching for objects which towered many feet above the water the smokestacks of some vessels rise a hundred feet above the water line and the masts reach up to much greater altitudes aside from this in the early days of the war steamers burned soft coal and their funnels belched forth huge columns of smoke which was visible from twenty to thirty miles away when this was realized efforts were made to cut down the superstructure of a ship as much as possible some vessels had their stacks cut down almost to the deck line and air pumps were installed to furnish the draft necessary to keep their furnaces going they had no masts except for slender iron pipes which could be folded down against the deck and could be erected at a moment's notice to carry the aerials of the wireless system over the ship from stem to stern was stretched a cable familiarly known as the clothesline upon which were laid strips of canvas that completely covered the superstructure of the ship these boats lay so low that they could not be seen at any great distance and it was difficult for the u-boats to find them they were slow boats too slow to run away from a modern submarine but because of their lowly structure they managed to elude the german u-boats when they were seen the u-boat commanders were afraid of them they were suspicious of anything that looked out of the ordinary and preferred to let the clothesline ships go the british mystery ships the germans had some very unhealthy experiences with the q boats or mystery ships of the british these were vessels rigged up much like ordinary tramp steamers but they were loaded with wood so that they would not sink and their hatches were arranged to fall open at the touch of a button exposing powerful guns they also were equipped with torpedo tubes so that they could give a u-boat a dose of its own medicine these ships would travel along the lanes frequented by submarines and invite attack they would limp along as if they had been injured by a storm or a u-boat attack and looked like easy prey when a submarine did attack them they would send out frantic calls for help and they had so-called panic parties which took to the boats meantime a picked crew remained aboard carefully concealed from view and the captain kept his eye upon the enemy through a periscope disguised as a small ventilator waiting for the u-boat to come within range of certain destruction sometimes the panic party would lure the submarine into a favorable position by rowing under the stern as if to hide around the other side of the ship at the proper moment up would go the white ensign the british man-of-war flag the batteries would be unmasked and a hail of shell would break loose over the hun many a german submarine was accounted for by such traps submarines themselves used all sorts of camouflage they were frequently equipped with sails which they would raise to disguise themselves as peaceful sloops and in this way they were able to steal up on a victim without discovery sometimes they would seize a ship and hide behind it in order to get near their prey camouflage on land but the call for the wielders of the paintbrush came not only from the sea 
their services were needed fully as much on land and the making of land camouflage was far more interesting because it was more varied and more successful besides it called for more than mere paint all sorts of tricks with canvas grass and branches were used of course the soldiers were garbed in dust-coloured clothing and shiny armour was discarded the helmets they wore were covered with a material that cast no gleam of light in every respect they tried to make themselves of the same shade as their surroundings like the indians they painted their faces this was done when they made their raids at night they painted their faces black so that they would not show the faintest reflection of light a paper horse the most interesting camouflage work was done for the benefit of snipers or for observers at listening posts close to the enemy trenches it was very important to spy on the enemy and discover his plans and so men were sent out as near his lines as possible to listen to the conversation and to note any signs of unusual activity which would be likely to precede a raid these men were supplied with telephone wires which they dragged over no man's land and by which they would communicate their discoveries to headquarters some very ingenious listening posts were established in one case a papier-mache duplicate of a dead horse was made which was an exact facsimile of an animal that had been shot and lay between the two lines one night the carcass of the horse was removed and the papier-mache replica took its place in the latter a man was stationed with telephone connection back to his own lines here he had an excellent chance to watch the enemy on another occasion a standing tree whose branches had been shot away was carefully photographed and an exact copy of it made but with a chamber inside in which an observer could be concealed one night while the noise of the workmen was drowned by heavy cannonading this tree was removed and its facsimile was set up instead and it remained for many a day before the enemy discovered that it was a fake tree trunk it provided a tall observation post from which an observer could direct the fire of his own artillery fooling the watchers in the sky in the early stages of the war it seemed impossible to hide anything from the germans they had eyes everywhere and were able to anticipate everything the allies did but the spies that infested the sky were the worst handicap even when the allies gained control of the air the control was more or less nominal because every now and then an enemy observer would slip over or under the patrolling aeroplanes and make photographs of the allies lines the photographs were carefully compared with others previously taken that the slightest change in detail might be discovered airplane observers not only would be ready to drop bombs on any suspicious object or upon masses of troops moving along the roads but would telephone back to their artillery to direct its fire upon these targets of course the enemy knew where the roads were located and a careful watch was kept of them the french did not try to hide the roads but they concealed the traffic on the roads by hanging rows of curtains over them as these curtains hung vertically and were spaced apart one would suppose that they would furnish little concealment but they prevented an observer in an aeroplane from looking down the length of a road all the road he could see was that which lay directly under his machine because there he could look between the curtains if he looked obliquely at the road the curtains would appear to overlap one another and would conceal operations going on under them in one case the germans completely covered a sunken road with canvas painted to represent a road surface under this canvas canopy troops were moved to an important strategic point without the slightest indication of such a movement hiding big guns nature's tricks of camouflage were freely used in the hiding of the implements of war on land our big guns were concealed by being painted with leopard spots and tiger stripes the color and nature of the camouflage depending upon the station they were to occupy in many cases they were covered with branches of trees or with rope netting overspread with leaves 
so careful was the observation of the air scouts that even the grass scorched by the fire of the gun had to be covered with green canvas to prevent betrayal of the position of the gun roads that led nowhere in the making of an emplacement for a gun it was of the utmost importance that no fresh upturned earth be disclosed to the aerial observers even footpaths leading to it had to be concealed plans were carefully made to cover up all traces of the work before the work was begun where it was impossible to conceal the paths they were purposely made to lead well beyond the point where the emplacement was building and still further to deceive the enemy a show of work was sometimes undertaken at the end of the path wherever the sod had to be upturned it was covered over with green canvas the earth that was removed had to be concealed somewhere and the best place of concealment was found to be some old shell hole which would hold a great deal of earth without any evidence that would be apparent to an observer in an aeroplane if no shell hole were handy the excavated material had to be hauled for miles before a safe dumping ground could be found as far as possible everything was sunk below the earth level big pits were dug in which the mortars were placed or if a shell hole were empty this was used instead shadowless buildings any projection above the ground was apt to cast a shadow which would show up on the observer's photographs this was a difficulty that was experienced in building the hangars for airplanes the roofs of these sheds were painted green so as to match the sod around them but as they projected above their surroundings they cast shadows which made them clearly evident to the enemy this was overcome by the building of shadowless hangars that is hangars with roofs that extended all the way to the ground at such an angle that they could cause no shadow except when the sun was low in some cases aeroplanes were housed in underground hangars the approach to which was concealed by a canvas covering as for the machines themselves they scorned the use of camouflage paint was little protection to them some attempt was made to use transparent wings of celon a material similar to celluloid but this did not prove a success the photographic eye although camoufleurs made perfect imitations of natural objects and surroundings they were greatly concerned to find that the flying observers could see through their disguises to the naked eye the landscape would not show the slightest trace of any suspicious objects but by the use of a color screen to cut out certain rays of light a big difference could be shown between the real colors of nature and the artist's copies of them for instance if a roof painted to look like green grass were viewed through a red color screen it would look brown while the real grass which apparently was of exactly the same shade as the roof would look red it had not been realized by the artists who had never studied the composition of light that there is a great deal of red in the green light reflected by grass and that if they were to duplicate this shade of green they must put a certain amount of red paint in their imitation grass roofs air scouts did not depend upon their eyes alone but used cameras so that they could study their photographs at their leisure and by fitting the cameras with different color screens they could analyze the camouflage and undo the patient work of the artist a call for the physicist to meet this situation another man was summoned to help the physicist who looked upon color merely as waves of ether who can pick a ray of light to pieces just as a chemist can analyze a lump of sugar under his expert guidance colors of nature were imitated so that they would defy detection aside from this the physicist helped to solve the tricks of the enemy's camoufleurs but the physicist had barely rolled up his sleeves and got into the fray when the armistice was signed which put an end to the shams as well as to the realities of the great war while the work of camouflage was not completed we owe an inestimable debt to the men who knew how to fake scenery and to their learned associates who count the wavelengths of light and although their trade was a trade of deception and shams there was no sham about the service they rendered making ships visible while in war safety lies in invisibility 
in peace the reverse is true now that the war is over it may seem that the work of the camoufleurs can find no useful application but it was impossible to learn how to make objects invisible without also learning how to make them conspicuously visible as a consequence we know now how to paint a ship so that it will show up more clearly in foggy weather thereby reducing the dangers of collision we know too how to paint light ships buoys etc so that they will be much more conspicuous and better guides to mariners and how to color railroad signals and road signs so that they will be more easily seen by locomotive engineers and automobile drivers End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Submarines It was an American invention that dragged America into the war, an American invention in the hands of barbarians, and put to unspeakably barbarous use. After seeing how the Huns used the submarine, we are not so sure that we can take much pride in its invention, but if any blame attaches to us for developing the submarine, we made amends by the ways in which we fought the German U-boat and put an end to German frightfulness on the sea. Of course, the credit for Germany's defeat is not for a moment claimed by Americans alone, but it must be admitted that we played an important part in overcoming the menace of the U-boat there is no question that the submarine was an american invention to be sure we can look into ancient books and find suggestions for navigating under the surface of the sea but the first man who did actually build a successful submarine was david bushnell back in the revolutionary war after him came robert fulton who carried the invention farther he built and operated a submarine for the french government and in more recent years the submarine became a practical vessel of war in the hands of john p holland and simon lake both americans however we are not interested just now in the history of the submarine but rather in the development of this craft during the recent war with great britain as an enemy germany knew that she was hopelessly outclassed on the sea but while britannia ruled the waves she did not rule the depths of the sea and so germany decided to claim this realm for her own little attention did she pay to surface vessels except in the dogger bank engagement and the battle of jutland the german first-class vessels did not venture out upon the open sea and even the lighter craft merely made occasional raids under cover of fog or darkness only to cut and run as soon as the british vessels appeared the submarine boat or unterseeboot as the germans called it was virtually the only boat that dared go out into the high seas consequently the germans specialized upon that type of craft and under their close attention it grew into a highly perfected war vessel but the germans were not the only ones to develop the submarine as we shall see construction of the u-boats when the great war broke out the german u-boat was a comparatively small craft less than a hundred and fifty feet long with its main hull only twelve feet in diameter it could make a speed of twelve knots on the surface and only nine when submerged but as the war progressed it grew larger and larger until it attained a length of over three hundred feet and its speed was increased to twelve knots when submerged and eighteen knots on the surface it is not always safe to judge a thing by its name to do so is apt to lead to sad mistakes one would naturally suppose from its name that a submarine is a boat that lives under water like a fish but it is not a fish it is an air-breathing animal that prefers to stay on the surface only occasionally diving under to hide from danger or to steal upon its prey during the war the german u-boats did not average three hours per day under the surface because they were intended to run on the surface they had to be built in the form of a surface vessel so as to throw off the waves and keep from rolling and pitching too much in a seaway but they also had to be built to withstand the crushing weight of deep water and as a cylinder is much stronger than a structure of ordinary boat shape the main hull was made circular in section and of heavy plating strongly framed while around this was an outer hull of boat shape 
as shown in figure eighteen putting holes in a tank to keep it full the space between the inner and outer hulls was used for water ballast and for reservoirs of oil to drive the engines and strange as it may seem the oil tanks were always kept full by means of holes in the bottom of them as the oil was consumed by the engines water would flow into the reservoir to take its place and the oil being lighter than water would float on top the false hull was of light metal because as it was open to the sea the pressure on the inside was always the same as that on the outside the reservoirs of oil and the water ballast tanks protected the inner hull of the vessel from accidental damage and from hostile shell and bombs there were water ballast tanks inside the inner hull as well as shown in the cross-section view of figure eighteen the water in the ballast tanks was blown out by compressed air to lighten the u-boat and the boat was kept on an even keel by the blowing out or the letting in of water in the forward and after tanks a heavy lead keel was attached to the bottom of the boat to keep it from rolling too much in case of accident if there were no other way of bringing the boat to the surface this keel could be cast loose at the forward end where the torpedo tubes were located there was a torpedo trimming tank torpedoes are heavy missiles and every time one was discharged the boat was lightened and the balance of the submarine was upset to make up for the loss of weight water had to be let into the torpedo trimming tank a submarine cannot float under water without swimming in other words it must keep its propellers going to avoid either sinking to the bottom of the sea or bobbing up to the surface to be sure it can make itself heavier or lighter by letting water into or blowing water out of its ballast tanks but it is impossible to regulate the water ballast so delicately that the submarine will float submerged and should the boat sink to a depth of two hundred feet or so the weight of water above it would be sufficient to crush the hull so it is a case of sink or swim usually enough ballast is taken on to make the submarine only a little lighter than the water it displaces and then to remain under the vessel must keep moving with its horizontal rudders tilted to hold it down the horizontal rudders or hydroplanes of the u-boat are shown in figure seventeen both at the bow and at the stern the main hull of the vessel was literally filled with machinery in the after part of the boat were the diesel oil engines with which the u-boat was propelled when on the surface there were two engines each driving a propeller shaft it was impossible to use the engines when the vessel was submerged not because of the gases they produced these could easily have been carried out of the boat but because every internal combustion engine consumes enormous quantities of air in a few minutes the engines would devour all the air in the hull of the submarine and would then die of suffocation and so the engines were used only when the submarine was running awash or on the surface and then the air consumed by them would rush down the hatchways like a hurricane to supply their mighty lungs engines that burn heavy oil the oil engines were strictly a german invention in the early days of the submarine gasoline engines were used but despite every precaution gasoline vapors occasionally would leak out of the reservoirs and accumulate in pockets or along the floors of the hull and it needed but a spark to produce an explosion that would blow up the submarine but rudolf diesel a german invented an engine that would burn heavy oils in the diesel engine there are no spark plugs and no magneto the engine fires itself without electrical help air is let into the cylinder at ordinary atmospheric pressure or fifteen pounds per square inch but it is compressed by the upward stroke of the piston to about five hundred pounds per square inch when air is compressed it develops heat and the sudden high compression to over thirty times its normal pressure raises the temperature to something like a thousand degrees fahrenheit just as this temperature is reached a jet of oil is blown into the cylinder by air under still higher pressure immediately the spray of oil bursts into flame and the hot gases of combustion drive the piston down 
because of the intense heat almost any oil from light gasoline to heavy almost tar-like oils can be used as heavy oils do not throw off any explosive vapors unless they are heated they make a very safe fuel for submarines to drive the u-boat when no air was to be had for the engines electric motors were used there was one on each propeller shaft and the shafts could be disconnected from the oil engines when the motors were driving the motors got their power from storage batteries in the stern of the submarine and under the floor forward the motors when coupled to and driven by the engines generated current which was stored in the storage batteries the submarine could not run on indefinitely under water when its batteries were exhausted it would have to come to the surface and run its engines to store up a fresh charge of electricity the electric motors gave the boat a speed of about nine knots in addition to the main engines and motors there was a mass of auxiliary machinery there were pumps for compressing air to blow the ballast tanks and to discharge the torpedoes there was a special mechanism for operating the rudder and hydroplanes and all sorts of valves indicators speaking tubes signal lines etc the tiny hull was simply crammed with mechanism of all kinds and particularly in the early boats there was little room for the accommodation of the officers and crew the officers quarters were located amidships and forward there were the folding berths of the crews in the later boats more space was given the men the large u-boats carried a crew of forty and as the hazards of submarine warfare increased more attention had to be paid to the men fat men not wanted oddly enough small slender men were preferred for submarine duty not because of lack of space but because it was apt to be very cold in a submarine particularly in the winter time the water cooled off the boat when the submarine was traveling submerged and the motors gave off little heat while when the vessel was running on the surface the rush of wind to supply the engines kept the thermometer low this meant that the men had to pile on much clothing to keep warm which made them very bulky the hatchway was none too large and a fat man were he bundled up with enough clothing to keep him warm would have a hard time squeezing through in the center of the vessel was the main hatchway leading up to the conning tower which was large enough to hold from three to five men this was the navigating room when the vessel was running submerged and above it was the navigating bridge used when the submarine was on the surface in the conning tower there was a gyroscopic compass a magnetic compass would not work at all inside the steel hull of the u-boat and here were the periscopes or eyes of the submarine rising from fifteen to twenty feet above the roof of the conning tower there were usually two periscopes they could be turned around to give the man at the wheel a view in any direction and they were used sometimes even when the vessel was running on the surface to give a longer range of vision the blindness of the submarine now a submarine cannot see anything under water the commander cannot even see the bow of his boat from the conning tower and until he gets near enough to the surface to poke his periscope out of the water he is absolutely blind and must feel his way about with compass and depth gauge it was always an anxious moment for the u-boat commander when he was coming up until his periscope broke out of the water and he could get his bearings and even that was attended with danger for his periscope might be seen of course a periscope is a very insignificant object on the broad sea but when a submarine is moving its periscope is followed by a wake which is very conspicuous and so the u-boat ran a chance of being discovered and destroyed before it could dive again to a safe depth later telescoping periscopes were used which could be raised by means of a hand lever the submarine would run along just under the surface and every now and then it would suddenly raise its periscope for an observation and drop it down again under cover if there was danger nigh this was much simpler and quicker than having a six or eight hundred ton boat come up to the surface and dive to safety he might even collide with a vessel floating on the surface 
but to lessen this danger submarines were furnished with ears or big microphone diaphragms at each side of the hull by which a ship could be located by the noise of its propellers in the bow were the torpedo tubes and the magazine of torpedoes at first there were only two torpedo tubes but later the number was increased to four these were kept constantly loaded so that the projectiles could be launched in rapid succession if necessary without a pause for the insertion of a fresh torpedo in some submarines tubes were provided in the stern also so that the boat could discharge a torpedo at its enemy while running away from him each tube was closed at the outer end by a cap and at the inside end by a breech block the tube was blown clear of water by means of compressed air and of course the outer cap was closed when the breech was open to let in a torpedo then the breech was closed the cap opened and the torpedo was discharged from the tube by a blast of air the torpedo a torpedo is really a motor-boat a wonderfully constructed boat fitted with an engine of its own that is driven by compressed air and which drives the torpedo through the water at about forty miles per hour the motor-boat is shaped like a cigar and that used by the germans was about fifteen feet long and fourteen inches in diameter we used much larger torpedoes some of them being twenty-two feet long ours have a large compressed air reservoir and will travel for miles but the germans used their torpedoes at short ranges of a thousand yards and under cutting down the air reservoir as much as possible and loading the torpedo with an extra large explosive charge we found in the diesel engine that when air is highly compressed it becomes very hot when compressed air is expanded the reverse takes place the air becomes very cold the air that drives the motor of the torpedo grows so cold that were no precautions taken it would freeze any moisture that might be present and would choke off the engine with the frost and so an alcohol flame is used to heat the air the air motor is started automatically by release of a trigger as the torpedo is blown out of the torpedo tube by means of gearing the motor drives two propellers these run in opposite directions so as to balance each other and prevent any tendency for the torpedo to swerve from its course the torpedo is steered by a rudder which is controlled by a gyroscope and it is kept at the proper depth under water by diving rudders which are controlled by a very sensitive valve worked by the weight of the water above it the deeper the water the greater the weight or pressure and the valve is so arranged that should the torpedo run too far under the pressure will cause the diving rudders to tilt and the torpedo comes up again then if the torpedo rises too high the valve will feel the reduction of pressure and turn the rudders in the other direction the business end of a torpedo is a warhead packed with about four hundred pounds of tnt at the nose of the torpedo is a firing pin with which the warhead is exploded ordinarily the firing pin does not project from the torpedo but there is a little propeller at the forward end which is turned by the rush of water as the torpedo is driven on its course this draws out the firing pin and gets everything ready for the tnt to explode as soon as the firing pin is struck but the firing pin is not the only means of exploding the torpedo inside there is a very delicate mechanism that will set off the charge at the least provocation in one type of torpedo a steel ball is provided which rests on a shallow depression and the slightest shock the sudden stopping or even a sudden swerve of the torpedo would dislodge the ball and set off the charge hence various schemes proposed by inventors for deflecting a torpedo without touching the firing pin would have been of no value at all guns on submarines as torpedoes are expensive things the u-boats were supplied with other means of destroying their victims the germans sprang a surprise by mounting guns on the decks of their submarines at first these were arranged to be lowered into a hatch when the boat was running submerged but later they were permanently mounted on the decks so they would be ready for instant use 
they were heavily coated with grease and the bore was swabbed out immediately when the boat came to the surface so that there was no danger of serious rust and corrosion the three-inch gun of the early months of the war soon gave way to heavier pieces and the latest u-boats were supplied with guns of almost six-inch caliber and there was a gun on the after-deck as well as forward the u-boats depended upon radio telegraphy to get their orders and although they did not have a very wide sending range they could receive messages from the powerful german station near berlin the masts which carried the radio aerials could be folded down into pockets in the deck from stem to stern over the entire boat a cable was stretched which was intended to permit the u-boat to slide under nets protecting harbour entrances and in later boats there were keen-toothed knives at the bow which would cut through a steel net during the war german and austrian u-boats occupied so much attention that the public did not realize the part that the entente allies were playing under the sea america great britain france and italy made good use of submarines operating them against enemy vessels blockading enemy ports and actually fighting enemy submarines a steam-driven submarine the british in particular did splendid work with the submarine and developed boats that were superior to anything turned out by the germans for instance they developed a submarine which is virtually a submersible destroyer it is three hundred and forty feet long and it can make a speed of twenty four knots on the surface the most remarkable part of this boat is that its engines are driven by steam its boilers are fired with oil fuel there are two smokestacks which fold down when it submerges of course when running under water the vessel is driven by electricity and it makes a speed of ten knots it carries three four-inch guns two forward and one aft and its displacement submerged is twenty seven hundred tons as against eight hundred tons for the largest german submarines a submarine that mounts a twelve-inch gun still more remarkable is the big super submarine designed by the british to bombard the forts of the dardanelles but unfortunately it was built too late to be used there the submarine carries a gun big enough for a battleship it is of twelve inch caliber and it weighs fifty tons of course a big gun like that could not be fired athwart the submarine it might bowl the little vessel over even though it was a seventeen hundred ton submarine the gun is mounted to fire fore and aft with a deviation of only a few degrees to one side or the other so that the shock of the recoil is taken by the length instead of the beam of the submarine it fires a shell weighing six hundred and twenty pounds and a full charge is not used so that the extreme range is only about fifteen thousand yards this submarine monitor would have been a very difficult target for the turkish gunners to hit when the war came to an end and the german submarine surrendered to the entente allies at Aurich, there was considerable public curiosity as to whether or not an examination of the u-boats would disclose any wonderful secrets but they contained nothing that the allies did not already know and one british officer stated that the plans of the german submarines had often fallen into their hands long before a u-boat of the same type was captured End of chapter 12